I want to talk to you about data driven modeling in Julia. So first of all, thanks for having me here. My name is Julius Martin. I work um, at the Otto von Guericke University at the Institute of Mathematical Optimization and also um, at Pumas AI. So Chris already told you a lot about scientific machine learning and its impact and what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I was told there are many control engineers in here. So right. Um, but maybe we start at my motivational speech for this whole topic. As scientists and engineers, we know a lot. Right. We have yeah, up to three, four hundred years of prior knowledge, Newton standing on the shoulders of giants and so forth. But there's also a lot we don't know. And I am a mechanical engineer. I am this is my go to model. Model me friction. And then you can say, OK, I have Coulomb friction and this is just a linear um, term in my ODE. But what if you have some static term in friction? What if you go deeper? And I uh, was working for some time in the robotics simulation community. And how do you do derived friction models for using torque control? This is very, very difficult. And this can go up to PDE models for a simple friction model of the inside a motor. So what we typically do is we include all those models, perform Monte Carlo simulations, and then evaluate which model to uh, do best. Um, on the other hand, we have we have our classical uh, system identification, right? So we have as scientists and engineers, we um, have a system, sigma, we want to observe. We have some variables going into the system here denoted by Z. We have some observed output Y, and we want to compare that with our estimator system. So, and then we end up with this classical comparator problem with some loss function or metric, um, and we want to minimize the error in terms of this loss. So, and what we typically assume is known, and this is also a point uh, made by Chris, is the function inside our system model. But this is the hard part, actually. And if we hadn't have this three, four hundred years of previous research, then we wouldn't have that model inside there. I mean, in the robotics community, we rely heavily on the Euler-Lagrange or Lagrange formalism for, uh, for modeling systems. But this works not every time, and this doesn't include friction. Then, um, of course, we have uh, yeah, biological systems or pharmaceutical systems are perfect examples. We have just a diffuse um, yeah, prior about what's going on. So we have some very well established mechanisms in there. But for example, feedback mechanisms in cancer growth, these are difficult. We don't know anything or we ha don't have a clear knowledge in all of the various types of cancer and what's going on. So our goal in data-driven estimation is to find not or not only to fit the parameters here, but to find the model structure F alongside our data. So, and of course, some inequality constraints and equality constraints. And before we dive deeper into this topic, um, let us think about the system models at hand, right? And the first um, system model which comes to mind can be a direct system or what I call in data driven diff, uh, diffq a direct system. And this takes in this variable z and just maps it directly to the output. So we have no structure in there. This can be just an arbitrary mapping from one space to another space. And this z here can be um, basically a triplet. So assume in the putting on my control head here. We have the states of the system at a specific sample point. We have some external control inputs to the system denoted by U, and we have a time point or sample ID. And this goes to the another state, which is the observed variable we classically know from control, right? And the key component here is that we have, yeah, we have don't, don't have uh, really causal interpretation of the system. This is just um, yeah, the observed function in classical nonlinear control. Then we have a discrete system. So discrete time steps, and here the next state of the system depends on its previous state. 
and the previous control input and the previous time. So we have some kind of causality going on here, and we have some prior knowledge about our system structure. And this is should be also reflected in the algorithms we use. So for example, I won't go in, into uh, that much detail on Koopman operators, but these are relying heavily on this structure. And of course, um, the or the classical example, the differential continuous uh, system, right? So we have our observed variable is now not the next state or some arbitrary observed variable, but the time derivative. And we can we assume we can observe that. Then we have as inputs the state at this specific time point, the control inputs at this specific time point, and the time itself. And why I make this nice block diagram for it, or I think it's nice, uh, this block diagram for that is to show you, okay, um, it's it's just a general model of models, right? So this um, extended state Z here basically incorporates everything, incorporates everything. And the reason why I do that is how do we um, process that in a nice algorithmic way to make it as po or extendable or general as possible? Because we don't often have systems with controls or might not uh, encounter that. On the other hand, one might say, okay, everything is a control system and interconnected, depends on how you define your boundaries. Um, but this is the basic assumption. So we have three models uh, or, yeah, informational priors on our data. So we have either a direct mapping with no causality, a discrete system, and a continuous system. And now we, I want to start going into an example. So I hope this is, yeah, it's, it's kind of good visible, but uh, I start with the classical nonlinear pendulum. And we have a control input here denoted by UI, which is just some force on the actuation level and some nonlinear friction term. And to do that in or simulate that in Julia, we use ordinary different Q and um, yeah, basically that's it. <laughs> and you see here, I write down the equations of motion. And then I plug in a simple exponential to the control system. So this is a torque acting on my simple pendulum. And this is the output I'm getting. Then I add some noise to the system to uh, yeah, basically do a more realistic simulation. And I collect my data. So here I collect my system uh, trajectory at the noise. Then I collect the timestamps of my solution. And then I also collect the control function. So I assume I don't know anything about this scaling here, the force added to the system, but just the function I used to generate something like a voltage in the motor, right? <clears throat> so, the question now is how can we generate this model just from data? And for this, I go back to sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, um, which was also a part of Chris talk, but a little bit more in detail. So what we see here is a nonlinear differential equation, right? But what you can do is you can linearize it in the right set of observables. So here I choose a basis or a set of observables really where I can rewrite this nonlinear equation as the sum of some nonlinear observables. So instead of focusing on all the nonlinearity in here, I just pull that out and get a nice matrix uh, form and a vector of nonlinear observables. And if we formalize that further, we can denote this here by chi, which is a coefficient matrix, and this is a phi, so my observables again. And we see a very nice structure here because this he is sparse. In this, um, or not in this basis, because I chose it to be uh, to include almost every term. But if you blow um, our space of nonlinear observables up to, because we don't know anything, or know ev we don't know everything about the system. So we could include also polynomials up to higher order, which don't really um, 
have an impact on the dynamics, right? So ideally we would here have a sparse matrix with many, many zeros. So we can see that we can encode some systems we don't know as a simple sparse regression problem. And this is the key algorithm here. So um, this was introduced by Brunton and Cutts in 2016. Um, and they showed that you can, by solving the Lasso problem or sparse regression problem really, um, on the data of uh, the sense collected over trajectories, you can reconstruct unknown dynamical systems. And if you think about our structure again, you can just right here at the left hand side. So this X dot can be anything. So the next state, some some output for the direct system. And what's important is here how we choose to do the basis. So in and we also saw modeling toolkit, right? So what we do in data driven is we rely heavily on symbolics, JL and modeling toolkit to form this uh, embedding space of observables we want to work in. So what I do here is I define my um, state variables and the control variables. I know that I probably will have some sine and cosine functions in there because I see, okay, I have measurements in radians or something like that. So angular position. I know that uh, only my first state is in angular position, so it doesn't make sense to include something like the sinusoidal of the velocity. And then I include uh, some polynomial basis, so mixed polynomial terms of those two states up to order five. And my control input. So, and this gives me in total 24 different nonlinear equations as a basis. And since we want to solve everything in SIML, we solve this. So we first need a problem. And this brings me back to the problem definition from the beginning. So we have a continuous system. So we derive a continuous data driven problem. We give in our sample or our state trajectory and our timestamps and the control function. This is something we measured before, right? And we don't measure the state derivative, so we use a numerical approximation for that with the kernel smoothing. And then we can also plot the problem. And we see here our smoothed out states, given that we use a Gaussian kernel to approximate that. Here is the time derivative approximate, still a little bit wiggly, but that's all right due to the noise. And then we have also um, the control input. So we see, okay, if you remember, this was an exponential with a peak at around five. This um, checks out. And next we choose an algorithm. And since we want to do sparse regression, we choose the originally introduced algorithm from the uh, sparse regression paper. So sequential threshold at least squares. And what this algorithm does, it, it solves a regression problem and looks at the coefficient and each coefficient, which is below a certain threshold gets set to zero. And the, yeah, you start basically by including the full basis and then cancel out or uh, do subsets. And only those who contribute gets passed on to the next round. So you shrink down this, um, yeah, the best subset basically. And since we don't know this threshold in advance, we have to do a Pareto optimal analysis, right? So, so we vary the threshold on when to use this zeroing technique and just use the model which fits the data best using a selection criterion like ICACA information criterion or Bayesian information criterion, with, which takes into account uh, um, the number of parameters of our model. And then we solve the problem with the algorithm, the basis, and some hyper um, options here. For example, we sample here the data um, from the problem a few times and batch it. This makes sense because we still have this wiggling going on. So what's happening here is the algorithm um, solved the problem five times, one for each batch, selects the best, and in each batch it iterates 
over these, I think, uh, hundred samples or hundred different thresholds. And this takes about, I think, 0 0.2 seconds or something on my book with, um, I don't know how many, 1,500 1, data points. So it's it's quite fast. And then we have a look at the result, and this is also an abstract system, so completely composable with modeling toolkit. And we see, yay, we get the right equations of motion out of that. And then we can also plot the solution against our problem data. The problem data on the left and here on the right is our solution, so the approximation of our time derivative and the error in between the prediction and the um, original data. So this does not look good, but if we just plug it into an ordinary differential equation problem, so we have here the typical form for using functions in SIMEL. So you have U, P, T, which is the state, the parameters, and the time. And then we extend that, so our result is callable. We extend that with the control function as a fourth argument in this case, and then solve the ODE problem. This could be also done more efficiently with using modeling toolkit directly on the derived equation, but for the sake of this argument, this is enough. And then we solve the problem and we see here the original in white, dashed white, and in blue and red is our estimation. And we can also have a look at the recovered equations down here. And we see that the parameters match nearly, given that we have a slight or quite high amount of, of uh, noise in our data. So to, to wrap that up, what's data driven doing is enabling you to just plug in as little information as possible. So about the system structure, about the data you collected and some priors to generate understandable equations. And this is exactly what we're doing. So for example, in the UDE approach you saw, um, you extract information for, uh, via a neural network inside your dynamics. And this has two advantages. First of all, the neural network is smooth in most cases, so it's a better fitting every time instead of using this sparse regression approach, which is quite can be quite difficult um, if you think about the L1 norm. And second, you extend your training data because you get a predictor out of there. So if you sample just 10 data points within time span of 0 to 10 seconds, and you train a UDE on that, you can sample it with a frequency of 0 0.1 seconds, and then you have 100 data points to perform that sparse regression on. And also you shrink down the, the um, yeah, basically the, the, or the, the model versus data rate. Right, so because you extract just a part of the model using this scientific prior you have, you uh, will be much more efficient, um, or the model will be simpler in most cases if you use the right prior. And then sparse regression is not the only algorithm we uh, have in data driven. We have also Koopman operators and generators, which are similar to sparse regression, but not quite. So Koopman basically states if I have a discrete or continuous system and I choose the right set of nonlinear observables, it's becoming linear. The caveat is that the space of nonlinear observables is maybe infinite, so we cannot really derive that but approximate that. We also um, interface symbolic regression and this gives you a much better toolkit. So if you think about or for symbolic regression, of course, if you think about sparse identification, you have to have the right basis in there, right? So if you if you cannot do that, then it will not work. And symbolic regression is doing a genetic programming approach or genetic algorithm really, where it samples different equations, keeps a current um, elite and resamples it and performs a um, search similar to simulated annealing or genetic, yeah, as I said, genetic programming and finds so, um, an equation out of a possible set of uh, yeah, yeah, combinatorial space out of possible equations, which fits the data best and has the lowest complexity. 
And then we provide also OCAMnet, uh, which I'm going to rewrite using LuxJL and not FluxJL. And OCAMnet goes um, a more reinforced learning inspired way. So you use not a binary tree like in symbolic regression, but you use directed acyclic graph similar to your neural network. And instead of having just one activation function, you have a set of possible functions. And in each layer, the, um, you sample basically a dominant function, so some individual out of the graph. You sample also, also the inputs, and you repeat that for all layers. And then you come up with a, um, an equation. You do that 10,000 times and use the reinforced algorithm. And this works well, but there is a caveat. You cannot really put in trainable parameters in there at the moment. So this wraps up my open source um, part of the talk. And now I'm going to tell you about something uh, yeah, with in cooperation with uh, Pumas AI, so deep in MLE or deep Pumas. And first of all, what is Pumas for me as a control engineer? I, I was thrown in there. So covariates uh, was slightly confusing at the beginning, but really what Chris told you again um, is right, of course, but I see it. What are, what are models, or this is a statistical tool, right? So we have a variety of different models, which all behave the same, but are uh, parameterized differently. And they share a common parameter space. And these are uh, some ground truth parameters, and they have individual observable features, as we can say in the machine lang uh, learning language, and then they have random effects. So slightly noisy effects, which might have influence on the different populations. And then also we have this pre-block, so all of the features and parameters get pre-processed and plugged into a model. So if we don't think about patients and human individuals, we can think about processes, different process subcomponents, which are used uh, in different locations, maybe also wells. I don't know that much about wells, but I could imagine that they share some features, stuff like that. Um, wind farms, robotics uh, in, in the process, in the manufacturing process. So we have all these systems which are similar, but do not behave the same. So example, wearing conditions or something. So they change over time. And what Deep NML E is doing, it's learning functional relationship within those models, right? So I just switched out just this nonlinear equation here with a multi-layer perceptor. And this is, I think, the common iteration of the API, which is going to be released. So we have multi-layer perception with two input, five hidden neurons in the next layer and one output. And we just call it here with age and weight and edit here. And this is it. Then you can just learn the model. There are various techniques on how to do that, but this is one possibility. So, and circling back to this data-driven estimation and symbolic regression. If you look at the sparse regression problem, you could interpret the error model here as a Gaussian and then the prior or the penalty on our parameters as a Laplace distribution. So what we can do in terms of a maximum a posteriori or maximum likelihood approach is write just our observed model, yeah, right? Just like a normal Pumas. And the only thing which we add is we add a Laplace prior on our data-driven domain, which we also introduce. And this allows us to do the same sparse regression on population-based models. And for the neural network I showed you earlier, we have done that to derive the um, impact of age and weight onto this unknown effect. So, and if you use the um, UK, uh, yeah, the, the ensemble approach, so I sample common subsets or different subsets um, from my basis, try to fit them, weigh them, and plug them in together, I end up with these equations, and we see that this term here looks pretty much like the ground truth. And the only thing which differentiates is this. But if you 
look at it closely, okay, um, uh, 0 0.82 divided by 38.52, this is roughly in the same order of magnitude. And then we have this constant, which you can also see in the parity plots, which is off. So here we have the sparse recovered versus the multilayer perceptron. Um, then we have the ground truth versus multiplayer perceptron. Both are off a little bit. And sparse basis versus ground truth is off in the different direction. So this is uh, something I'm investigating still. So this is, uh, yeah, welcome to my research. Uh, but um, this gives me hope. And also I have uh, yeah, other experiments which I didn't want to show because I wanted to, to highlight what we can do here. Um, is I learned, for example, that mass is volume times density from, from a single pendulum uh, example where I plugged in bases directly. And you can also derive really nonlinear models with, with uh, using that whole machinery. So derive, uh, finding the ground truth of parameters. And by the way, here, these are trained parameters. So we allow also priors on the parameters and parameterized basis elements within Pumas opposed to data-driven DFQ, where this is not implemented yet. Yeah, maybe to wrap up a little bit. So data-driven DFQ defines the common structure for, for performing data-driven estimation and inference of various system types um, and a general API to allow for comparison of those algorithms um, and a tight integration within the whole CIME, uh, CIML ecosystem. Whereas deep Pumas or deep NMLE extends Pumas to use embedded neural networks to leverage really this machinery and make it reproducible for the industry in pharmaceutical and other domains. And embedded also sparse regression for now. We are building also a bridge for using other algorithms, but for now this is the uh, yeah, beta package for just using Pumas out of the shelf. Um, yeah, and with this I go to my references and thanks for the Time. I think I'll end a little bit off. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. I have lots of questions, and maybe <laughs> you also have questions. Uh, questions, sort of uh, trying to understand what's going on and what if there are limitations. If oh, I, there are definitely limitations. Yeah, there are many. <laughs> so, so essentially, if you if I use X as a state, so mm -hmm. you, what you have is something like this, right? Yeah. And you try to find this, uh, what's the chive? Yeah, he, I, I he think. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could also write A. <laughs> yeah, or B that a lot of people use. Yeah. Um, and then you say that if you the, your lambda goes to zero, you have least squares. Mm -hmm. And if lambda goes to infinity, you have uh, L1. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you have a yeah, finite you... lambda mm -hmm. positive value, uh, lambda, you have this last yeah. method or something. Yeah. Of course, the, the couple of questions is you have observed x values. Mm -hmm. So, how do you find dxdt? Yeah, this is um, either we use some neural network and learn just some, some smoothing or something. Yeah. Or okay, we... so you, 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 let's go back into yeah. this. Yeah. So, so the the whole the so the difference uh, you know so di so direct system right actually I, I like the you know so so go to that other slide yeah so so yeah right there you can see that there's a cur there was a kernel inside of the continuous yeah. system right um, that kernel is telling you how to do the 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 derivative calculation okay right? and so essentially if you have a time series if, if you have data there's three different uh, data driven problems right yeah. there's direct problem which is just for, you know, assume that you know I have you know uh, x, uh, I have I have x and y, and I want to find out f of x, right? Mm. The, the 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 discrete one is I have x, and I have this uh, discrete dynamical system. Find the yeah. dynamical it's system. discrete is simpler. Yeah, and then the continuous one is you know I have time time series data. No. Taking this time series data, give me a derivative estimate, and now apply okay. the derivative. Yeah. So yeah, so like they, they basically have two system types. That then uh, transform data into the form for the direct yeah, one. Yeah. But yeah, they're just getting high level. So, follow up question. Mm -hmm. you know, since you have mechanical engineering background, yeah. suppose you only measure the position and not the velocity. Yeah, this is hard. So, uh, then you uh, you have uh, you only observe a subset yeah. or even a transformed subset of the states. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Yeah, again, uh, so, so I'm 
my my go to tool is really the UDE because yeah. then I can I mean I have some assumptions about that so so for for the position or if I just measure the position then I know the the prior knowledge that position velocity and acceleration exists so I would just embed that and differentiate two times or try to come up with a model with uh, which does exactly that mm -hmm. and train then the neural network at the lowest ac acceleration level use my common knowledge that position and the entire derivative of the position with respect yeah, to times velocity. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm just curious because I, I like this idea mm -hmm. and uh, I, I tried to learn a little bit about uh, neural networks and differential equations a few years ago where I sort of simulated a very s stupidly simple system in Modelica where I could take out the derivatives mm -hmm. and just fit it a neural network. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, in principle, you could replace this with a neural network. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. the, the, and then the model discovery is kind of the reverse process where you sort of yeah. fit the neural network and go back to this where you specify some physical reasonable basis functions. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, um, well, so, so I mean, I'd actually put it as, as I'd underline the other thing, right? Because, you know, you, for, well, first you, you know, fit, you fit, you know, U prime equals neural network, right? Yeah. But then the, the data driven discovery is you, you take the neural network, right? You, you sample it a bunch of points. And yeah. that gives you the dx dt, so you put it on the left side there. Yeah, so you take it. that out and uh, <laughs> assume that the neural network is the truth. And then exactly. You yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, final question for me is in this symbolic regression ID. What is the flexibility in defining basis function? Can you choose anything? Like, could you have a sequence of radial basis functions, for example? Or yeah. Well, it's, it's, any, it's any function that's representable in modeling toolkit. And so, you know, you can... You can even have it, you know, so modeling toolkit, right, is a symbolic system which can be extended by using registration. Mm -hmm. So you can say at register vessel on there, and then you can have vessel functions in there. So it's, I mean, it needs to be some kind of function that I think that there is a restriction that it's scalar, right? So you have to, yeah, yeah so it has to be a function that takes in a scalar, it, it spits out a scalar, mm -hmm. but it could be a mutually a function that is of that form. So if you, for example, have a sequence of heaviside functions, yeah, yeah. you actually have and you do a sparse identification, you get a neural network. Yeah. Should. I didn't try that. I should do well, that. Well, I mean, I think that with that, you, you probably instead of wanting to do this bit, you probably want to use the convex software. But I mean, that's, that's what a neural network is. It's kind of a sequence of. of yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if it's pure rate. Rate. that's if it's pure rate. Yeah. Yeah. If it's this uh, step function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could use the uh, arc tank function or something. Yeah. A sequence of that, and then you could sort of use this idea to find a neural network. And that, that's basically what reservoir computing is kind of doing, actually. So, mm -hmm. reservoir computing turns a network neural network training into a least squares problem of this form. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, we're going full circle here. Yeah, I mean, it would be <laughs> creating a neural network without using this. Uh, these traditional training methods. Exactly. And, so that's, and you would yeah. only have a limited sort of finite set of uh, locations for the for the step functions or the. Yeah. yeah so the continuous time vector state network is basically you, you take your your time series data for for the neural network and you write it into this form to then be able to find the projector function. You know, given given the the reservoir being the the phi of s, which is uh, uh, you know which is uh, you know directly identified. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, so they're, they're all these all these methods are heavily related. You know? mm -hmm. okay. you're, you're finding out that yeah, we're a one trick pony. Just that you know, you're doing very similar things all around. They have very different effects. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. Mike. Right. So, uh, sorry, I'm um, not going to glitch here. So, uh, I was wondering if uh, integer programming, so generally within symbolic regression, if uh, using some integer programming algorithms. As, as a place. Uh, and I asked because, um, like the developer of, of, of Baron, the NLP software, has this Alamo toolkit. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what use it on the Alamo system, but I think the static system seems to be doing something somewhat similar where basically it solves, and I think, my NLP and then it basically gets rid of the, the basis functions that are not used and then, yeah. Like a discrete um, variable for you can choose or not to. Just wondering if that direction of integer programming. There is one paper yeah. I. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Um, so 
the question was, uh, is mixed integer programming also in symbolic regression? And I know at least of one series of papers, and the last of which is uh, published by Bertsimas et al. In, so at least as a, as a preprint on optimization online, and is going to be at informs at some later point this year. But what you do is you basically use this binary tree structure again, and each of the nodes uh, can have one exact decision, right? Which represents that. And then you choose the operator, and uh, you have a specific set of constraints on how to do that. So, for example, it does not make sense to do an exponential of a parameter or constant, because this is just another parameter or constant or to, to follow up exponential and logarithm, because this would equate to identity. And um, they show that they are indeed good at medium-sized problems. So they benchmark on the Feynman database, and um, for most of the cases, they are better than AI Feynman if the problem is small enough, but if it's get, uh, getting bigger, then it becomes harder. And they also show that you have a relaxation to, to find feasible solutions inside this neighborhood, which is quite nice. Um, but yes, um, the other way is reinforcement learning. And this is hard, or in my opinion, really related to, to the mixed integer programming approach. And there I can point you to deep symbolic regression, which trains an agent to spit out the best equations um, while traversing this binary expression tree. Um, and also from, I think also from Bertsimas, mixed integer in milliseconds, where you, uh, do you know that? So you train an agent to on the solution of an optimal control or integer optimal control problem, and then uh, you derive the equation from the neural network, which is trained on that. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that would be an upper form of what it did. I mean, if you, he, 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 here's the idea, right? So we just uh, a paper that was, uh, you, you know, we can just retire, or we can take the derivative of, uh, of um, you know, we can take the derivative of discrete stochastic equations, yeah. right? Um, so if you can relax that formulation, right, into something that's a discrete stochastic formulation, then you can get something that's the, uh, you know, that can that can give you integer form, right? So what you do is you basically say, you know, I, I allow my extension of this this linear form, uh, where now for things that are supposed to be uh, categorical variables or integers, yeah. I represent them by Bernoulli uh, random variables of p, right? So the, uh, so you represent them by Bernoulli random variables of p, and then you you do that you do, you solve that exact same problem yeah. except through gradient descent, right? Uh, to be able to get the the minimize the expectation. And that will give you Bernoulli P's where, you know, hopefully then they will either go to, you know, the P's will go to one or they go to, to zero, right? In which yeah. case you then relax them from the conversion variable to the, to the integer. And this would be really nice because commonly this, this lasso approach from the mixed integer um, point of view relies or relies heavily on an upper bound for the number of basis functions to include. And then you end up doing the same Pareto optimality or the same Pareto front analysis just with an integer instead of a lambda. And yeah. this is not, yeah, you you, you win nothing. Yeah, so that. I'm pretty sure that that would like get a hundred times faster than mm -hmm. what it is, but so much is implemented now. So. <laughs>